On October 9th, 1995, God taught me very personally the truth that life is like a vapor. Growing up on the West Coast, I picked up surfing, loved to catch waves, loved to surf. And we had moved out to Florida and on the, the, in the Gulf of Mexico, the big pond out there, the only time you can have surfable waves is when the hurricanes would kick up surf. And so um, a storm system had set in. Uh, my brother and I decided to go down and catch uh, big waves. And when we got down to the beach, uh, I remember there just being really, really big surf. And we were, we were racing, and uh, we were trying to see if we could get to the water first. And, and I remember just tearing my clothes off, and, and, and then in this mad dash, I went running down uh, the beach, and I could see this, this swell uh, was reforming. And as I raced down the beach as fast as I could, at the last minute, this wave curled up, and just as it crashed on the beach, I dove headlong into the wave. And when I hit the wave, something happened. I watched him run and dive, in, dive into the ocean, and uh, I realized I had I had lost the race, so I just kind of turned around. I was taking care of my clothes and folding them and stuff. And uh, after I was finished with that, my parents still ha hadn't arrived yet. Turned around, uh, looked at the looked out the, the water, and I didn't see my brother. It was like a shock just rushed through my spine. I knew something was wrong and, and instinctively I knew to lay still, uh, but the momentum of the dive you know, kind of carried me through the water. And I remember just kind of gliding through the water face down and the next wave, it, it, it rolled me over and I was groggy. And when I tried to get up, my body went away. Try as I might, I, I desperately tried to get to the surface, but, but I, I couldn't make it, I couldn't get there. I sucked in water and I passed out. Started just kind of looking around, calling his name, and I, I ran over to my dad. He said to us, Dad, we saw, he, I saw Micah dive into the water, but I can't find him. I don't know where he went, but I think he's in the water. And I remember looking out over that water and thinking it was so incredibly vast. Like if he's out there, you know, where is he? It looked impossible. Yeah. My dad was searching, mom was searching, everybody was searching, I happened to look over. They were, they were yelling something and we looked over and we didn't know what was like, there was some kind of commotion. So I think that's what drew our attention. And, and one of them picked up my brother's arm, which we didn't see my brother at that point, but we just saw him pick up his arm and they saw that he wasn't breathing or anything and they just dropped his arm and just saw it just just flop in just completely you know a dead man as I saw the arm flop and without seeing the body the, the face I knew it was our son and the worst had come true at that moment you know, my mom saw it too, and she just, she just, when you hear screams and movies and stuff, and, but when you hear the real thing, it's different. So when he ran to the water and lifted Mike out of the water, and I saw his blue, lifeless body, it was limp like a rag, parents' worst nightmare. And I'm just looking at my brother in disbelief, just thinking a minute ago I saw him dive into the water. And now he's dead. There were people all around him. By then the paramedics had arrived and they were uh, working on him. Uh, that, that's the first moment of hope that I even recall that anything could be done. 
And I just fell to my knees and just cried out to God for his life. I got there to the hospital and he was alive. And he was just full of fluids and they didn't know if he would make it. So for four or five nights, it was touch and go, life and death. And the neurosurgeon breaks the news and says this may, he's paralyzed from the neck down. This may be as good as it gets. And when I came to, there was tubes in my nose, tubes in my throat. I was in a foreign room. There were sensors going off. I had no idea where I was or what was happening. I remember seeing my father sitting in the corner of the room, bags under his eyes, hadn't shaved. And the very first words out of my mouth were, how did I do in the game? And I remember my father looking back at me and he said, son, you didn't play, you broke your neck. For him, I was just devastated. Like, he's gonna live, but his life is gonna be reduced to a chair and someone having to care for him. And I didn't want that for him. Uh, I was put in a helicopter and I was life flighted to Tampa General Hospital. I was told I'd shattered four vertebrae in my neck. I was totally quadriplegic. And I was looking at life through the lens of if I survived, I was gonna be potentially paralyzed forever. He'd gotten a little bit, little bit of color and actually was twitching a little bit. Um, and acted like he was trying to say something to us, but he couldn't because he was innovated. Your nerve endings are, are firing. Your body is shrinking. I'm, I'm in constant torment. And then I can't touch my face. I can't tend to myself. If I need a drink, I gotta ask somebody. And I would lay there at night and I would, I would think about my state and I would just think, God, please take me. I don't wanna be here anymore. For me, seeing, seeing my brother, who's two years younger than me, and just an amazing athlete, and incredible young man, and to see what looked like at that moment, his life just ripped away. It was, it was, you have a lot of questions. God, why are you letting this happen? What good could possibly come from this? We got through that period, and they were able to take him off. Uh, the machines they had him on to help keep him alive. I, I was m moving his toes and I saw, I saw one of his toes twitch, his big toe, I think it was on his right foot. And I said, Micah, 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 you just moved your toe. Like, do it again, do it again. And everybody started to perk up and, and, uh, and I said, come on, do it again, do it again. And he was like, I'm trying, I'm trying. It went from the big toe just barely twitching to having control over it a little bit and a couple other toes then maybe moving his foot or his ankle a little bit and it was just like little baby steps but it started happening, it started happening and then the doctors were getting hope and they said, you know, he may be able to walk again someday, you know, but he's going to have to relearn how to walk, he's going to have to relearn this. And Really from there, um, there was just grueling rehab. The intensity of the pain that my body was experiencing is, is really hard to put into words. Um, there was physical, occupational, um, psychological therapy, um, electrical stimulation, and it was months of just this grueling process of, of trying to fight back for, for whatever, whatever I could get back. On one occasion, I stood him up to try to see if he could stand up, and I was holding him under his arms. He fainted. And so I put him back in the wheelchair, and he's gone, he's out. The intensity of the, the pain and the blood rushing from my head, sometimes it would be so much that everything would just go white and I would just pass out and find myself just laying limp in his arms or laying limp in the wheelchair. And in those moments where the pain was at its greatest and the intensity would become so strong, God would visit me and His Spirit 
would remind me that, that he was there and that he was present and that he was doing something that I didn't understand. It was a challenging, challenging period. It was a mix of fighting and wanting to fight and that part kicking in, but then also being so overwhelmed that I just wanted to lay down and die. And over time, that, that will to fight and this, this thing that God was doing in my heart, uh, it, began, it became the dominant force. And I looked up to the, to the God of heaven and I told him, if you just simply let me touch my face, I will never ask for anything more than that again. And I remember deciding at that point, God, you have been faithful and you have been good. And whatever you give me, I will use for your glory. And I'm gonna focus on your mission, your purpose for my life, and not what I don't have. I'm gonna celebrate what you've already given me. Uh, when I went back to school, I'm now, uh, my muscles had atrophied. I'm, I'm just off wearing a neck brace. I've been in a neck brace for six months. Um, I'm skinny as a rail, struggling with insecurities. I was used to being the popular athlete that knew how to make friends, being, the, being in the limelight. And now um, I'm, I'm the kid in the shadow. Uh, and God began to open my eyes in a real personal way, uh, in a real personal way to just the number of people that go through life uh, that are really unseen. I begin to be convinced that should God give me more back, that I wanted to use that new platform to serve those that are down and out. And I begin to see in God's word uh, these two overarching themes. Right? Since the fall of man in Genesis 3, like God has been redeeming a people to himself and he tells those who he's redeemed to join him on mission. But the second theme that I begin to see in scripture, um, the great command, care for the poor became real. Over 2,000 times in God's word, he tells his people to care for the poor, to serve the marginalized, to come alongside the broken. And so now this, this idea of invest your life got teeth. Um, uh, direction surfaced. To invest my life, it needed to be spent making disciples and serving the poor, right? Meeting needs and feeding souls. Believe it or not, I couldn't play football, basketball, or baseball because of my upper body, but I ended up playing, I ended up making the college soccer team. And so, so here I am, uh, I had I had sports were my idol and they were stripped from me. And now that I had fully given that to God and was totally okay with not playing sport again, he returns the gift and allows me to play college soccer. But, but now the perspective was totally different. And so um, myself and some of our uh, my friends on the basketball team and on the soccer team, we really set out not just to compete, but to use that platform to help connect people to God. And we started uh, doing these, uh, these outreaches inside of the inner city, the poor district in the community that we lived. And that's really where uh, I connected with my now wife, Audrey. I remember sitting in the school cafeteria and seeing uh, a, a young man walk in and he had some kids behind him, probably like five, five ragtag kids. I knew they weren't his kids. And I just watched him and um, he led them through the cafeteria line and he paid for their food and he put food on their plates. And then he went to a table that was all by itself. It's just an empty table and he set the kids down and they prayed and they ate. And I remember looking at my roommate who was sitting next to me and I said, who is that? And he, she said, uh, oh, that's Micah, but um, he doesn't date. You don't, you don't even need to get to know him. I said, no, I need to know who that is because that's my heart, those kids. But I began to ask him about these kids. and. And I said, you know, please tell me, like, obviously they're not your kids, but tell me, like, they're with you all the time. What's your relationship? And he just began to share how um, they were kids in a close-by neighborhood. And I had actually recognized the neighborhood because I could tell it was a, an underprivileged neighborhood. And I remember asking him, I said, well, are there any, because these were all, like, um, mainly little boys, which made sense. And I said, well, do they have sisters or they're little girls? Because I would love to help. And he said, absolutely. He's like, there's so many kids. There's such need. I would love for you 
to get in and help. And I said, okay, so where do I start? And he said, well, let's go visit Joey and his family. So I remember we went to pick up Joey and he had five siblings, three of which were little girls. And we took him to get something to eat and I began to minister to these little girls. And, and from there, it just was a natural, like we began doing ministry together in this neighborhood. And five kids turned to 10, that turned to honestly like 50 to by the time we left college, it was over 90 kids. And um, the small little church we went to had to buy a couple of buses to help us get these kids to to the WANA programs because we could no longer fit them in our cars. <laughs> we started putting on these clinics where young people would come and we'd do skills training and, 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 and help them learn technique that would make them better on the field. But we'd also feed them. Uh, and then we would share the good news of the gospel with them. In this ministry, we didn't even really have a name for it. It was just a ministry. It was just seeing the need and meeting the need. And there would be people who were just drawn to it. Like, how can I help? I remember, um, you know, people we'd go to school with and that were on our basketball teams or soccer team and be like, hey, can I help? How can I help? Because it was just contagious. So I continued education, um, I'm working on a master's in counseling, but we're still doing inner city ministry. We're still serving through our local church. And it was during that time that I entered a, a 40 day fast and prayer and discernment period. It was a partial fast. And for me, I was really pressing into God saying, God, what is it that you want me to do with, with all my life? Uh, one day when I went down to meet my accountability partner, he wasn't in his office, but there was someone who was there who had come back from Africa. And as I sat down in the office, I was talking with them and listening to them talk about these experiences in a slum in East Africa. I remember the person sharing um, how poor people were and, and how much uh, there were physical needs. But I also remember him sharing that there was this passion for football, what we call soccer, and how if someone could come and put something together that cared for the physical needs, but also mobilized sport as a vehicle, how it could truly be a tool to reach more people than we could imagine. And after that meeting, I just felt like my heart was burning. And I, I went home and I just felt impressed that maybe I was supposed to go to Africa. Now I had never been on a missions trip. No one asked me to come to Africa. And I began to think like, man, this is crazy, this is a crazy thought. And so I pulled out my journal and I began to write down in my journal, here's the 12 reasons why it makes no sense for, for Micah to go to Africa. And there were some, some real obstacles, things like I had you know, taken on some college debt, but I got all the way down to like, I have a Sprint phone contract, right? And you can't cancel a Sprint phone contract. And so anyways, I end up going to dinner with this gentleman that I had sat down with and I was asking him about his experience in Africa and, and I started asking him hypothetical questions like, hey, you know, what if somebody was feeling that maybe God was calling them to, to go to Africa but they had a Sprint phone contract? Like, how would you advise him? And throughout the course of that conversation, there was, there was ultimately no obstacle that God could not overcome. And finally, I just pulled out the rest of my journal. And I laid it on the table and I said, look, I'm asking questions for me. After praying about it, he just felt led that he had to go. Something in him was that he had to go. So I remember he decided he would go on his Christmas break from school and he raised enough money to go spend all of his Christmas break there. And I knew the moment, the moment he left, this is what it was all. Like, I remember it just being so clear that he'll be going back. Here I am. Um, I'm, uh, what, 23, 24 years of age, uh, and I, I decided to go to Africa. There were over 300,000 people trying to survive on less than $1.25 a day. It, it was, the poverty was incredible. Uh, human beings uh, living in 10 shanties on top of each other. I remember going to a lady's house named Velma. Uh, there were 12 people sleeping in her home. Her brother had died, her sister had died. They, they had inherited their kids because of the AIDS epidemic. And as I'm standing in Velma's home, 12 by 14, dirt floor, I, I literally tell her like, I, it, it still doesn't compute, I don't understand. Like how, 
how do 12 people sleep here? And she points over to the soiled bed in the corner. And she says, my husband and I sleep here. One child sleeps to the right, one child to the left, one child sleeps across our feet. She points to the rickety table and she talks about how three kids lay across this table each night. She points to this makeshift bench along the 10 siding. She says, the rest of the kids sleep sitting up, arms crossed. And she says, we rotate because the bed is the best night's sleep. Now, I remember coming out of Velma's home and looking out at the mass of humanity, men and women, boys and girls, no different than ours, no less important to God than we are. I remember thinking, dear God, how challenging. Dear God, who will care for these people? I remember thinking about the scriptures and all the places where God had called his people to care for the poor. And I knew from that point, coming back from the slum, that I was going to spend the rest of my life trying to forget what I saw or spend the rest of my life trying to do something about it. Uh, when he came back, it was automatically, um, he had told the people that he had built a relationship with that if I have to if I have to row to come back, like row a boat to come back, I'll be coming back. And um, no, if you know Micah, you know that's very true. He'd get on a paddle boat and get back over there. He, he would try. And so I did what anybody else would do. I came back to the U.S. I dropped out of school. I moved in my car. And, and there was this burning vision that began to form in my heart. Uh, once Micah came back, it was a singular focus. It was uh, immediately start sharing to anyone who would listen the need that he saw and the vision that God had downloaded into his heart. Over an eight month period of living in the car, God crystallized the vision. We were able to apply for a nonprofit and assemble a board. And then I traveled around the country over 40,000 miles and some resources were raised. It was unheard of how quick that paperwork was filled out, sent in, and then was approved. And before you knew it, we were 501c3. and. Here we were, and Mike and I sitting in the library at school, and Mike said, what am I going to name it? I have to put a name on the application, and we threw around different names for this organization, and Micah, with his story of breaking his neck and learning that life was like a vapor, um, one, I mean, he would talk about it all the time, about to anyone that he could possibly share the gospel with or that he could be mentoring with, how the Lord had shown him that through this tragedy that life is like a vapor and I told my guys said you know if you don't name this vapor ministries you'll regret it for the rest of your life because that's how God um, has shown you and led you all the way here and so it was one of those quick things and he wrote it down and um, so we had our first board meeting in the schoolroom cafeteria yeah it was interesting because even though we weren't married and technically we weren't dating we were just best friends I was running the back end of the office from the dorm room and he was literally living in his car first of all the reason I lived in the car was to maximize resources there was no money there was no margin it was a huge leap of faith and so instead of a hotel room it would be sleeping on the front seat or if I was near a coastal area sometimes I would find like a lifeguard tower on the beach and sleep under it sleep on a park bench I would find lakes and streams uh, on a map and I had these shower shorts and you know my perk plus I would uh, jump into the water get out soap up jump back in the water uh, get dressed in the back of the vehicle uh, and then what would happen is is somebody would grant me a meeting and so I would take my I would take this little thumb drive where I had, we had made some uh, collateral material for vapor, some marketing material, and I would, I would go down to the staples and I would, I would print enough off for that meeting because there was, no, there was no money and I would put together a little packet and I'd walk in and you know stand up straight and I would share with this businessman or share with this pastor, hey, God is gonna raise up a ministry that's gonna reach thousands and thousands of people for Christ. Meanwhile, they'd never know that I was literally sleeping in the van down by the river. There were times where it was like, it was like the script was being written. I would, I would wake up at night and, and I would like come to almost like in a vision. There would be like blueprints being downloaded and I would get up and I would journal and I would write out and draw out images of, of what the ministry was going to look like. And I was fueled by 
um, that inspiration and by that faith. But there were other times where, you know, I just felt like giving up. So miracle of all miracles, while there was definitely challenges, God supplied, churches came together, partners resourced the vision. And, and here I am flying to Africa. So I moved in with, with two Kenyans and I lived on the edge of the slum. I didn't take a hot shower for a year. I ate on $1.50 a day. Goal one was to oversee the building of the center. The second goal was to develop the local indigenous people that would become the ministers, that would reach their people with the gospel and run the center. And then the third was to set up all the operating pieces. So after a year of this intense work of physically building the center and developing local indigenous people, leaders, disciples, we now had around 40, 50 disciples that were ready to serve. And the center was physically built out and it was opening day. And so we knew that we could take in 350 to 500 children, youth, and adults um, should they show up. And so we prayed and we fasted. We sent out uh, uh, handbills into the community. And I'll never forget on opening day, somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000 people showed up for the 350 spots. And we knew that day that truly this was a vision of God that he was going to use to reach many for the kingdom. So our team, they took me to the airport, dropped me off. I left three months salary in the bank, three months operating costs, and I flew back to the US. And, and I really told them as I was leaving, I said, look, I don't know what's gonna happen after these three months, but here's my guarantee. I promise that if you can't cash your check, I won't cash mine. We're in it together. Uh, some people were supporting me and supporting Vapor really to execute on this, this first build out and that support dropped off. Uh, and so I actually entered into another period of living in the car. Uh, during that time, within the first month, uh, I married my sweetheart, Audrey, and my bride, my best friend, who was really like keeping Vapor going uh, uh, from a back office standpoint. She saw something in the vision and saw something in me and, and poor girl, a sweet girl, uh, her first year of marriage, she spent in a car. At the time, wireless internet wasn't everywhere, so we would Google a Panera somewhere and we would decide that that would be where we'd office for the day. Um, and then, you know, there'd be times where we'd pull into a gas station and um, I had this little box that you plug into the, um, the cigarette lighter of the car and it came, it was like a little outlet and so I'd plug my curling iron into that or our, we had one laptop that we'd share and do work off of and pull it into that but we'd pull in a gas station and I'd go into the bathroom and just wash off and wash my hair and then do my hair in the car. Micah would clean up in the gas station too then we'd show up at a meeting and they'd have no idea that we were living out of our car. You know we wouldn't mention it because then we thought oh that wouldn't be a lot of credit that they, they should invest in us. God began to put in my heart this, this vision for multiplication. What if we could set up an enterprise that would facilitate uh, the mobilization of the church and um, the deployment of indigenous people and capital so that we could have operating centers in slums all over the world? And so during that year, we weren't only casting vision and, and, and raising resources to sustain mission, but we were praying. God, show us where you would have Vapor Ministries International Headquarters. I had never met anybody living out of their car that were, you know, trying to do something big. Uh, and as I inquired about that, uh, it was, it struck me that what they were trying to do is to pour all of their resources into the ministry. We at Purcell Farms, as God would have it, there were some things that were lining up that we didn't need, we had extra of, that perhaps Vapor Ministry would need. Uh, for instance, Micah and Audrey were living out of their car and uh, my wife and I had just moved out of a small house because our house had been renovated. So we offered the house. I can remember uh, Ellen and I talking to them and saying, hey, we've got this, this house you can live in for free. It's furnished. Uh, we'd like to offer this up for you. And they were very gracious and they said, 
uh, thank you very much, but we're going to have to go and pray about it. And I'm like, what's there to pray about? It's a free house. He says, no, he, he uh, you know, they wanted to pray about it and he showed a lot of wisdom because he knew that if he settled here, this is where vapor would, would grow their roots and their ministry. As we began to pray and fast over it, we, you know, we had questions that we sat down with um, the Purcell family about and just saw that their hearts were so linked to ours and they had become like family to us anyway. Um, and so we accepted the offer to move to Sylacauga, Alabama, and we moved into uh, where we still live today, a little farmhouse on the property that was our first office and also housed some of our first employees. At the end of the day, free was good stewardship. So my wife and I moved from a slum to a car and out of a car into Purcell Farms. Now we had an operating center in East Africa, a vision to establish more and, and a headquarters here in America. And, and I began to pray that God would give wisdom on how to structure the ministry and build out the team. God began to bring uh, amazing uh, board members and advisors, counselors, uh, brothers like Ken Polk, who is a very wise Christian businessman who still serves as our chairman of the board today. And so as the, as the chairman of Vapor, um, I am excited about um, several things. One is I love Micah's energy. I think that uh, Micah's energy has really been able to propel um, Vapor to get better. And, and I always look at an organization and, and look at them and say, are they going to be uh, better tomorrow or are they going to stay where they are? And I can tell you that Vapor is going to continually get better. They're going to continually use the resources that they've been blessed with in order to impact more people, to touch more people, to, um, to get more people out of poverty and to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we mobilized a, a couple from from East Africa and sent them to West Africa where we put in our very first center in an area that was unreached and unengaged in the middle of a voodoo epicenter. We saw a center open and hundreds initially come to faith in Christ and now thousands come to faith in Christ. And now today we're divided into six distinct departments with overseers over each of those. And, and we have five operating centers serving hundreds of thousands of people. We have over 485 team members serving in various capacities. We ended up establishing micro businesses in the slums and, and then eventually a couple of businesses in the U.S. We have uh, thrift stores that help op offset some of our operating costs. And, and I look at it today and I see a group of amazing uh, partners across the country that supply resources. I see board members and, and, and advisors that are constantly offering us wisdom and, and helping the ministry grow in knowledge and expand. Uh, we have amazing team members that bring their best to bear every day and help advance the mission. And we're seeing God move through His people as, as, as really I stand on the shoulders of a bunch of godly men and women who, who advance the mission every day. And it's just it's so amazing to see God move and work and bring the vision into reality. And we just believe that God isn't done. We believe that our best days are yet ahead. And we believe he's going to draw more partners into this ministry. And that one day, by the grace of God, we will serve millions. You know, when I see the sinners in action, it's just like, to me, it's like glory to God. Because I, I know myself and I know you know, um, Micah's story, obviously. And to me, I look and I, I see individuals, you know, because they've become more than just faces or numbers. I know their names, their families. And now there's kids that I remember seeing at four or five, you know, running into the leagues. And now, you know, they're 18 or 19. And they, some of them are in university um, and they're leading, they're now coaches. You're asking God, like, what possible good could come from this? unspeakable good there's countless stories stories that like goodness we might not ever get to opportunity here till one day when we're in heaven about how vapor ministries is physically and spiritually impacted lives and hopefully and i know it will it'll ripple way beyond our lifetime
I look up to him so much. He looked up to me for years because I was his older brother, but I look up to him so much. God has used him in such a mighty way. My son has an absolute burning passion for lost souls all over the world. It was a battle he fought, but God won and he gave in and God gets the glory. And we're uh, so proud of him. If it was just for Haas me, one family, one boy, it would all be worth it. Viper is about helping people in Haiti and Africa and giving food and water. It means, it means helping. That's what God wants us to do. You know, I look back 20 years and I think that's treasure. That's treasure that, you know, no moth or rust can destroy and it's that no one can take away. I remember one particular time I was living in Africa and we had made progress on the center. We were about at the halfway point, but I was losing hope. I was overwhelmed by the challenges. So many things weren't working out. We were running out of money. It was just challenging. And I got up early in the morning before it was light and I walked down to the slum, to the center, and all I could see was people struggling. It was hurt. My heart was overwhelmed. I couldn't see the light. And as I sat there, the spirit downcast, I just began to sing. And I began to praise God. Even though I didn't feel it, I just began to recite old hymns that my mom had taught me. And as I sang, it was like God's presence began to fill me. And I remember Him just moving me from a place of I can't do it. I'm overwhelmed to a posture of hope. And he rekindled the vision. And as my spirits lifted up, some of the, the men I was discipling began to show up. Some of the, the ladies that had begun to work with us began to show up. And, and I asked them, I asked them to all sit with me and sit down. And now I'm all pumped up and I'm, I'm filled with the spirit. I'm encouraged and and I remember asking him, I said, hey, I said, look, look out over the slum. What do you see? And they looked back and they said, we see the dump. We, we see the slum. We, we see 10 shanties. And I said, okay, close your eyes, close your eyes. I said, what do you see now? And they said, the slum? I said, no, no, no. Over that dump, God has allowed you and I to build a beautiful rescue center. There's thousands of children, youth, and adults, and you are out there ministering the gospel. You are serving water. The slum is being transformed. And I remember later when we sat in this little room and I asked our brothers and sisters to raise their hands and who would go. I remember them, one of them, Christian Kalukie, who still works with us today, he stood up and he said, all of us were there. All of us thought this Mzungu, this white man was crazy. But all of us have witnessed the miracle of God through us. And today we're living in that vision. And he said, no one can tell me that anything is too big for our God. And I want vapor and I want the people connected to it to be a people that have audacious faith. They just believe that the God of the universe who spoke the stars into galaxies, that same God could take a kid that didn't know what he was doing and send him to the slum to execute what God had already planned for him. That that same God can raise us up and use us to do more than we could even think or ask. He's that good. He's that great. And that's the God we serve. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 39, 4 and following. He says, O oh Lord, help me understand my mortality and the brevity of life. Let me realize how quickly my life will pass. Look, you make my days short-lived and my lifespan is nothing from your perspective. Surely all people, even those who seem secure, are nothing but vapor. Surely people go through life as mere ghosts, accumulating worthless wealth without knowing who eventually will haul it away. But now, O oh sovereign master, upon what am I relying? You 
are my only hope.